Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath. All right. We're going to make a go with this here today. I'm new here. We just moved into the area in May. And uh, so we have not, I have not spoken anywhere but here yet. So this will be a, a new experience before you. <laughs> so, anyway, it's kind of like endless summer. I, we're, we're enjoying it here. We came from Northern Sacramento. Um, I'm working for the conference office here over in uh, Altamont Springs. So I'm enjoying your I-4. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of, I left busy California thinking, oh, this is going to be much nicer. It's the same thing. <laughs> At any rate, so we have New Smyrna Beach. This is, uh, we're just going to make this work today. Uh, normally I have my computer here, so my notes are actually on the thing back there. And I took pictures of my notes, so that's what I'm going to be reading up here. So um, let's just get into it, shall we? We've got some things we want to cover. I want to talk to you today about types and anti-types. I was confused about types and anti-types when I first came into the church through the 98. And because I had looked at types and I looked at anti-types and I was thinking anti-Christ and it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And so I just want to show a little story today. We're going to do, talk about a couple of stories. Two stories that started out bad and that ended um, excellent mm -hmm. in the very end. All right, so our story here. Uh, going to be talking about the promised land and everybody who left Egypt that went to the promised land, they were born in Egypt, they were born into slavery. And as we, as we talk today, um, I, want, I want us to consider the time in which we live. So every time I reference Egypt, I want to back your mind and try to remember, okay, we're also thinking about modern day. How does this apply to us potentially today? All right. We are born in this world. The Bible says that if we're Laodicea, then we're all asleep, aren't we? You know, we're slaves to sin. And we have a solution to it. But let's just kind of look to see. Maybe we can learn a little bit about what we're in for. And a little bit about ourselves, perhaps, as we look at the children of Israel as they left Egypt. Okay. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out of the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. How many days did they go? Three days. Three days. Now when they came to Marah, they did not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. So they were there for three days. And this was the first complaint that they had of a list of complaints when they left the land of Egypt. Uh, there were ten that the Lord counted against them that subsequently caused their their demise. But uh, this was the first. And I'd like to take note just for a moment of the tree. What do you suppose that might signify? In the last days, if you think of our time, remember we're talking about these folks that lived then versus us who live today. Is there... No, maybe it's too hard to to get there. The tree, I think, a lot of the little scroll that, that as it was eaten, it was sweet in the mouth. And here we've got wood that's thrown into the waters, making the water sweet. What's different about it is later it was bitter in the stomach. In the latter days, here it was, for them right now, sweet. So I think there's kind of an interesting cast there. Let's go to the next one. All right. 
Great. All right, here we go. All right, so let's read through this. We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Who said this? Do you remember who it was that said this? It was all the, yes, it was all the spies that spent all the time spying out the land just before they were to go in and take possession. All right. And here's what's, what's that next word? Nevertheless. Nevertheless. That's like but, isn't it? Yes. But. All right. Nevertheless, the people who go on the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell on the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites. Oh no. <laughs> so they got themselves worked up. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Hold on, folks. Let's go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Was Caleb talking about overcoming it with his own power? No. no. Caleb had it right, didn't he? Yeah. And we're going to see exactly how right he had it. All right. So, what's the next word? But. but. The men who had gone up with him to spy out the land said, We're not able, for they're stronger than we are. And then they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land. I want you to remember this too. We're going to come back to this. They gave a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land, though which where we have gone as spies is the land that devours its inhabitants. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Alright, I threw this one in there just because I wanted to see the what happens with the mindset of these folks. Caleb had it right. He understood that the Lord was going to be with him. He understood that, that it wasn't going to be the children of Israel that took the land. It was going to be the Lord that gives it to them, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Alright. So the Lord judged them, the, the children of Israel, after they complained. And so then Moses told the children of Israel what the Lord had said. And what did the Lord say? Remember? You're going to be in the wilderness for 40 years. So they all rose up early in the morning and went to the top of Mount saying, hey, we're here, we're ready to take it now. We messed up, but now we're ready. And then Moses said, why do you transgress the command of the Lord for you will not succeed? Do not go up lest you be defeated by your enemies for the Lord is not among you. And said, because you have turned away from the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. This, I believe, is a warning to everybody today who rebel against the Lord. And so, when you realize that you've been in rebellion against the Lord, don't lose your wits. Keep your wits about you, because you don't want to compound folly with foolishness, which is exactly what these guys did. They, had, they were foolish. And then they came back and really screwed up. And it got a whole slew of them killed. Anyway, I wanted to throw that in there for us. Another thing I wanted to talk about this one. Did the Lord ever say, I'm going to have you take your swords and kill all of these people? Did he, did he actually say that in the Bible? As you read the story, the Lord said, I will deliver Well, we read later that it was pretty clear that he had planned to use hornets. Mm -hmm. Who's going to stick around with hornets? I don't care who you are. <laughs> you have a, a nest of hornets coming after you, you're going to run, aren't you? So I'm, I have to extrapolate from the story, and maybe that's why I shouldn't, but we're going to. Here's folks that were ready to bear arms, just like Peter took off the ear of the centurion. Jesus put the ear back on his head and said, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Let me do my thing, basically, and you do your thing. And so I think this is what we do whenever we decide we want to take, take up violence, basically, in the name of God. And we have a lot of that today. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, this one. All right. I want to compare what we just read to modern day. All right. This is for uh, testimonies of ministers, and this is in direct relationship to uh, Minneapolis. Is everybody familiar? familiar with what happened in Minneapolis in 1888, general conference session. They had a couple of gentlemen that came there and spoke. Uh, two men, uh, A.T. Jones and Mr. Wagner. And this is what Mrs. White had to say about that. The outcome of that meeting. The perils of the last days are upon us. Satan takes control of every mind that is not decidedly under control of the Spirit of God. Some have been cultivating hatred against the men whom God has commissioned to bear a special, special message to the world. They began the satanic work in Minneapolis. Who began the satanic work? The two men that were preaching? No, no. Or the group that was against them? Okay, this, this, is, this, is, this is amazing stuff. Afterward, when they saw and felt the demonstration of the Holy Spirit testifying that the message was of God, they hated it the more. Because it was a testimony against them. They would not humble their hearts to repent, to give God the glory and indicate the right. They went on in their own spirit, filled with envy, jealousy, and evil surmisings, as did the Jews. They open their hearts to the enemy of God and man. Yet these men have been pulled in positions of trust and have been molding the work after their own similitude as far as they possibly could. Who are we talking about here? Leaders. The Minneapolis crew were all the leaders of all the conferences throughout North American religion. And by and large, 75% plus were totally against listening to Jones and White. Totally. Let's move on to the next one. I was pointed back to ancient Israel, but two of the adults of the vast army that left Egypt entered the land of Canaan. Interesting, isn't it? Amen. Two. Two. Their dead bodies were strewn in the wilderness because of their transgressions. Modern Israel, who's that? Us. Us. We are in greater danger of forgetting God and being led into idolatry than were his ancient people. Many idols are worshipped, even by professed Sabbath keepers. God especially charged his ancient people to guard against idolatry. For if they should be led away from serving the living God, his curse would rest upon them. Well, if they would love him with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might, he would abundantly bless them with basket and store, and would remove sickness from the midst of them. Do we have sickness today? Yes. Do we have crazy rampant sickness today? Yes. <clears throat> Do we worship idols? success yes. and everything that the world says is financial success I wrote here that I believe that church leadership is probably the biggest idol risk because we're in the church and at least if you're not in the church you can recognize that hey I'm kind of going after the world and stuff Let's move on to the next one here. I just want to talk about experience here for a minute. 
the trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ illustrate the position of the people of God and their experience before the second coming of Christ. I think it's interesting that we use the word experience here because it could have been used beliefs or, I mean, that's what I typically hear from the pulpit is, you know, we talk about our beliefs or we talk about our behavior. Um, but this is more of an all-encompassing motive than anything else with this. So the trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ illustrate the position of the people of God in their experience before the second coming of Christ. And then Satan's snares are laid for us verily. What's verily? Surely? Absolutely. Absolutely. Without question. So Satan's snares are laid for us. Verily, as they were laid for the children of Israel just prior to their entrance into the land of Canaan. We are repeating the history of that people. So let's jump down. Let us, let us be worthy to not refuse the light that God sends because it does not come in a way that pleases us. Are we not pleased sometimes by the light that the Lord gives us? I have a problem with this one because it ends up there, and it says right after that, it says, if there are any of us who do not see and accept the light themselves, let them not stand in the way of others. But aren't we kind of taught that if we don't like what we're hearing, if we don't believe what we're hearing, that we should stand up and preach what is true? Kind of scary, isn't it? Because he's saying, he's saying here point blank, don't don't stand in the way of others who are trying to follow the truth. Anyway. Right on. I I kind of think that as time wraps up, we're going to have this is going to be an interesting problem because we're going to have people that are not going to be accepting the light, but they are going to be standing in the way of those who are trying to accept the light. And they're going to be standing in the way of it out of self-preservation, not because they're being jerks. They're going to say, no, that's not the right way. And they're going to stand up with some righteous indignation and say, you're preaching error, when in actuality, what's being preached is correct. That's kind of a scary, that's a scary thought. So we're really going to have to do something in order to not be deceived by this right here. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've got some huge prophetic language in this one. Israel refuses to enter Canaan. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or only if we had died in this wilderness, why has our Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? This is a great part right here. That our wives and children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Hey, let's sign to find a new leader to bring us back to Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did what they always did. Okay, now this is this is interesting here. I just I want to touch on this because this is so this is so beautiful stuff. Okay, in the last days we're talking about Revelation where the king of the north and the king of the south pushes against the king of the north and the king of the north comes in and just decimates everybody. Okay, that's without getting into all this stuff. The king of the south is going to be secularism. Okay, the king of the south is always Egypt. Always it was always the stuff. Egypt always had the stuff. Right, they got the pyramids. Cool stuff. We have pyramids now where? Las Vegas. Perfect. Okay, so, <laughs> so they want to return to Egypt. They're standing at the threshold of the promised land that the Lord is saying, I'll bring you in. And they're saying, uh, we can't do it. Because they don't trust him. They don't trust that he's going to do what he's going to do. So they say, let's get for us a new leader. Let's get Bill Hybels and go back to Egypt. <laughs> okay? So, but Egypt is the king of the south. 
Is the king of the south going to be victor in the end? No. He's going to be totally decimated. All right. Anyway, I like this part. But who else is going to teach that stuff other than the Adventists? The only reason you know this stuff is because in the Adventist church, the apostate Protestantism doesn't understand any of the sanctuary. All right, so... Okay, I want to read this next, this next one to you here. You should read with Joshua. And that's right. All right. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, among those who spied out the land, they tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through the spy out is an exceedingly good land. Heaven is an exceedingly good land. Amen. If the Lord delights in us, does he delight in us? Yes. Then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Do we have to raise our swords and kill anybody in order to go to heaven? No. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. Do we fear the people of the land? We should. Yeah. You will. <laughs> because they're going to be coming from within your own, your own church. Yeah, and your own family. For they are our bread. Their protection is departed from him, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said, Amen, let's go. <laughs> they said to stone them with stones. And then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle. Remember I said this, think about what this is going to be like in our day. This is great stuff. So about the time they're going to stone us with stones, the Lord appears. Amen. In his tabernacle. Where's his tabernacle? <laughs> the sanctuary, isn't yes. it? Like the heaven sanctuary. Where all of us have pledged allegiance to Christ, who is sitting in the judgment seat. Amen. So when, he's a, when he appears, that's it, isn't it? Uh, All right. So I wanted to I wanted to I wanted to make a mention here. Do you see the level of, of um, trust that the people of God have for God? After you see what Joshua and Caleb say to them, this beautiful stuff. Their instant response is, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. So that's the level that we should then consider, is this what we're going to see with those around us in the very last days? Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of scary. Really, it says, do not fear them. <laughs> their initial response to what we think makes a lot of sense, hey folks, the Lord's saying we can go to heaven. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Does that make any sense at all? Anyway, so I've had to grapple with this kind of thought because it doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense rationally. But this is what they do. And this is what we can expect as well for the future. So if you preach the simple truth in faith, you are going to be targeted for death. It doesn't make any sense. But it seems to be dead on true. Alright, next slide. It is impossible for them to obtain a knowledge of Jesus Christ and of his light and knowledge unless they are advancing and are learners. So this is referring to anybody that's living in the last days, right? Yes. We are adding grace to grace. How do we add grace to grace? By saying more? No. Okay. So we add grace to grace because we trust in the Lord. If they do not bring into their households practical religion, they will soon lose it all. They will go into the meeting and carry through a form of prayer and exhort and perhaps hold some office in the church. But unless they are making advancement all the time, there is a decided want. And 
and they will swing back to their old position of ungodliness, just like any other sinner. This is so true. I, I, I've been working for the church for a decade, and it's totally true. Totally. I can, I can raise my hand. So I've been there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. It is important that we keep all the time adding grace to grace. And if we will work upon the plan of addition, I like this part, God will work on the plan of multiplication. Amen. Just as fast as we add, God multiplies His grace unto us. Add to what? Just as fast as we add what? This is to ourselves. This is as fast as we add understanding and a striving for Christ to live in us. He multiplies His graces for us to be able to do it. It's attainable. That's the point. It's all very attainable. Next slide. Alright, this is a great slide. Seventh-day Adventists would have, in 1888, entered into a time of refreshing, which would have culminated in the ushering in of the latter rain outpouring. And time would have wrapped up. We would not be here today. Amen. But they wanted to remain around Sinai's law, which was central to Adventist theology. The sanctuary was not applied, the only means to our salvation. Amen. It's a good thing you didn't come back then, isn't it? Yeah, we would be bunch, here. You have a whole bunch of lost people. Yeah. You know, and that's another thing, too. I'm glad you didn't come. Because yeah. that wouldn't be alive. Amen. And now they were like kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So it's, it's always a grace. Life is always a gift. Amen. All right. But anyway, I wanted to point out the word but again. Amen. But. All right. So we're on the next slide. Look at today's church. Let me read this one. I have had the question asked, what do you think of this light in which these men are presenting? Here's her answer. This is great stuff. She's probably, I can just see her just flabbergasted. Why? I've been presenting it to you for the last 45 years. Amen. The matchless charms of Christ. This is what I have been trying to present before your mind. So Amen. she had it. She got it. And she just couldn't seem to get through our thick skulls. I like this woman. She's great. I wish she was alive today. She probably. You're kind of afraid of her because she's kind of yes. calling out on me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so next slide. We are in danger of falling into similar errors. Never should that which God has given as a task be carried as was the subject of the law in Galatians. I have been instructed that the terrible experience at the Minneapolis conference is one of the saddest chapters in the history of the believer's present truth. And it is very true. Let's go on to the next one. Now what we want to present is how you may advance in divine life so as we're getting kind of wrapping up here. I want to be able to talk a little bit about what it is we can expect. We hear many excuses. I cannot live up to this or that. What do you mean by this or that? Let's talk, I just want to take a second, because sometimes this is, you get it. As, as you're studying it, you kind of fall into it, but it's just right here, it doesn't make a lot of sense. This or that, let's pick out a this or that real quick. I cannot live up to, um, oh, I'm a single person and I just can't, you know, constrain myself waiting for marriage. Or I have a hard time, um, you know, I just have like pork chops, I just do it, I don't care. I'm going to eat that stuff, I'm going to eat it anyway. Um, I don't want to go that, that cheap, but I'm just saying, when you say you cannot live up to this or that, you know, my mother used to yell at me, and that's just the way I was taught. That's just the way it is, right? Do you mean that it was an imperfect sacrifice that was made for the fallen race upon Calvary? 
that there was not sufficient grace and power granted us that we may walk, uh, that we may work away from our own natural defects and tendencies, that it was not a whole Savior that was given to us? Or do you mean to cast reproach upon God? Well, you say, it was Adam's sin. You say, I'm not guilty of that, and I am not responsible for his guilt and fault. Here are all, here all these natural tendencies are in me, and I am not to blame if I act out these natural tendencies. Who is to blame? Is God? Of 